Welcome everybody to our virtual Mid-Atlantic Women for Israel event entitled Reinventing Rosalie, One Woman's Journey to Resilience. My name is Phyllis Brown and I'm a proud member of JNF's Women for Israel Sapphire Society. I am the chair of WFI in Maryland and your event host for this program. I believe in JNF's work to build a stronger and safer Israel for this generation and many that will follow. JNF is my voice in Israel. It's so wonderful to have women joining us from all over the Mid-Atlantic region as well as across the country. As supporters of JNF, we have all made our commitment to our resilience and making a positive impact on the quality of life of all the inhabitants of Israel today. By now, I hope you've all had the opportunity to see and enjoy the film Reinventing Rosalie. Soon we'll be hearing from Dr. Lillian Glass, who as Rosalie's daughter was with her every step of the way. I'm sure we all look forward to hearing Lillian's perspective. But before we go, it's my distinct pleasure to ask Ronnie Wolk, National Assistant Vice President of JNF Women for Israel, to share with us her comments about where we stand in our national campaign today. Ronnie. Thank you, Phyllis. My name is Ronnie Walk and JNF is my voice in Israel. I'm the National Assistant Vice President of Women for Israel and the co-chair of the Sapphire Society. I am thrilled to be part of an event that speaks about the power of resilience. And today, I'd like to tell you about the resilience of our women. This past year, we faced our challenges, knowing we could make a difference. We took care of our families and friends and those in our communities who needed our help. And then we dug deeper. Our Sapphires, Chais, and Alliance members of Women for Israel, one of the fastest growing demographics in JNF, we all gave with our hearts, our leadership, and our pocketbooks. We gave in order to continue JNF's mission of taking care of the land and people of Israel. We supported JNF's partner organization, LOTEM, and helped fund a program which delivered computers to special needs children struggling to learn virtually during the pandemic. We became ambassadors for the Alexander Moss High School in Israel and recruited students for the new gap year semester in Israel program. Many of us worked on national task forces and regional committees. We got involved, we promoted JNF initiatives like growing the North and growing the South. We advocated for innovative water projects in Israel that enable the country to continue providing food and water to its growing population. We supported JNF's resilience programs in Israel's Eshkol region. Residents there are faced with the threat of danger on a regular basis. But thanks to JNF, instead of cowering in fear, families in these Gaza border towns are able to brave the harsh realities around them because JNF supporters have their backs. JNF offers resilience workshops to train community leaders. They fund programs that empower Eshkel's youth to stay strong and focus on helping others. They provide therapy sessions for those suffering from PTSD. They build bomb shelters where families can stay safe in the event of an attack. The bottom line is through our leadership, our involvement and our donations, we are helping to make Israel more inclusive, stronger, safer, and more resilient for today and tomorrow. Join me in supporting JNF and the Women's Campaign at the Alliance $360 level, the Chai $1,800 level, or the Sapphire $5,000 level. Becoming a Woman for Israel enables you to connect with other like-minded women, to use your voice and inspire others to do the same so that together we can make a real difference. 
On the screen, you will see the donation page, whose link should now also appear on your phone and in your email. Simply click it to make your donation to JNF. You may direct your donation toward the resilience programs or toward any other JNF initiative that is meaningful to you, that speaks to your heart. Thank you for participating in today's program. And now Phyllis Brown will introduce our main speaker. Thank you again. Thank you, Ronnie. Dr. Lillian Glass is an American communication and body language expert, a media commentator, a mediator, and an award-winning film director and producer. Her best-selling books include Toxic People, where she coined and popularized the term toxic people, which is very much a part of today's vernacular. She also wrote Talk to Win, Say It Right, and He Says, She Says. Dr. Glass has also written several books on body language, including I Know What You're Thinking, The Body Language Advantage, and many other books. Lillian has appeared numerous times throughout the media analyzing body language and communication of well-known newsmakers. She is also a jury litigation consultant where she helps prepare witnesses for trial and has served as an expert witness and mediator. Lily is currently directing and producing this, a sequel to her award-winning Reinventing Rosalie film, in which she shows more about her incredible mother, Rosalie's journey. The sequel will highlight their travels to and connection with Israel. As you can see, no grass grows under Lillian's feet. I am happy to present Dr. Lillian Glass to you to share her experiences as the daughter of the fearless Rosalie. On a personal basis, I'm fortunate to have been friends with Lillian since high school, and I'm sure you will find her words inspirational. At the same time, I would also like to introduce Michal Uziahu, our second presenter, who will speak immediately following Lillian Glass. She will address our resilience programming in the Gaza border communities. Michal is the director of the Eshkol Community Center and Eshkol is a region located along Israel's border with Gaza and Egypt. She is responsible for the region's community program management and strategic initiatives. And now I give you to Dr. Lillian Glass. I'm so honored to be here today. It's such a wonderful thing that you're doing and allowing me to speak about Rosalie Glass and the film is the biggest honor. And I know she would believe this was a huge honor for her as well. She stood for so much that you stand for, resilience, because that was what she was all about. And hopefully after watching the film, you'll see that her life was about reinventing herself. Resilience, not dwelling on the past, not being negative, not being hostile but having love in your heart and just going for life to the fullest. And that's what she did. What you're doing is so amazing with the Resilience Center. And it's just fantastic to have a safety net, have a place where people can go, where people can feel safe. And it's a wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful group of people that are supporting this. And Rosalie applauds you and I do as well. So just God bless you and keep up the great work that you're doing. I wanna say that uh, when Rosalie and I went to Israel and unfortunately you didn't see that in the film because it was cut out, but we went to the Western Wall and it was so touching and so moving and we, put a prayer there and we said prayers and it was just extraordinary. And one of the things that Rosalie wished for is for a strong, beautiful Israel to keep growing and to keep people safe. And that was showing how she was so embracing and so selfless in her prayers. Going to Israel the first time I went when I was uh, in college and on a study program. And then I 
decided, well, let me just hop on over to Israel from Europe. And I did that. And it was just fantastic to see the historical sites, <clears throat> to experience Judaism, especially being a daughter of two Holocaust survivors. It was one of the most moving experiences that I had. And then being able to go with Rosalie was an unbelievable experience because she always believed that we need Israel so much. Jews need a country. And she was so proud of Israel. And to be able to experience it and to see it was one of the highlights of her life. Rosalie, although she was Jewish, she considered herself Jewish, she wasn't necessarily a ceremonial or a practicing Jew. She was Jewish in her heart. She wasn't hypocritical. She walked the walk and she talked the talk. She was very warm and loving and sensitive and kind to other people. She was a queen. She was an amazing person wherever she went. And you saw this in the film, people were drawn to her. They were drawn to her warmth, her sincerity. And that's the key about being a Jew, being generous and open and kind and sensitive and inclusive. She, even though she embraced the Jewish faith, she said, and she mentioned this in the book that she wrote, Rosalie Glass, A Hundred Years of Wisdom, that in order to appreciate your own faith, you have to appreciate others' faith. And we made it a point when we traveled the world to go to various religious uh, events and to religious uh, temples and, and religious uh, churches so we could experience what other people have experienced, to appreciate their culture as well. And this was very, very beautiful for Rosalie, and she was touched by that as well. Rosalie had a very serious thing happen to her when her son died, my brother, unexpectedly and tragically in a medical malpractice situation where he was intubated improperly and became a vegetable and died. Rosalie was devastated. She was, as you saw in the film, she couldn't do anything. She couldn't talk. She couldn't do, sleep. She couldn't eat. She couldn't do anything. Nothing made her happy. And I thought I was going to lose her at that time. I was very, very worried about her. So I took her in and I tried to take care of her and nothing helped, nothing whatsoever. And then one day she suddenly woke up and said, you know, Abraham's gone, her husband, Manny's gone, and I'm going to live life to the fullest. And boy, did she ever. She embraced every bit of life and was happy and so joyful. And I asked her later, what was it that changed everything that moment when you woke up? What happened? She said, it was from God. And so Rosalie was a God-loving woman her whole life. She believed that God had a purpose for her, which obviously he did through her experiences, through her example, through the film, through her book. And it made a difference in other people's lives. But she embraced life. And that's what we have to do every single day. And I know at the Resilience Center and Many of you involved in this are living life where sometimes there is some fear. Sometimes it is not comfortable, but to go on and live each day with love and kindness to others and happiness and joy and find that joy. And that's what Rosalie was about. And that was her message. So that transformation that literally occurred overnight was a spiritual awakening. And we all have that within us, that we can have faith and do something remarkable with our lives, no matter how bad things seem. Resilience is one of the most important words that you can have in your life, because it's the essence of life. And that was Rosalie's life. If you had to put the word resilience next to Rosalie, it would be equal, because she didn't sit there and become a victim. She didn't say, oh, woe is me, oh, I'm so sad. 
she went on. And that's what we have to do is figure out what to do next, how to survive, how to survive without anger, without bitterness, with love in our hearts and move ahead. And that is what resilience is about. When I was a child, Rosalie and also my father, Abraham, they never brought up the Holocaust to me. They didn't want to burden me as a child with it. They wanted me to adapt to my childhood, to having friends, to embracing the American way of life, which they did. And they didn't want to burden me with the horrors of the Holocaust. When I was going to school, we didn't have Holocaust education. So it was something I really didn't know that much about. I knew vaguely that they were in the Holocaust, but I didn't really know much about it. And as an adult now, I'm so grateful for their protection of me in that area because studies have shown that those children, those young people that were brought up with the Holocaust, with that pain, with that burden, are different people. They have post-traumatic stress syndrome themselves. They have a lot of anxiety. They have a lot of pain, a lot of guilt, a lot of bad feelings. And thankfully, I wasn't exposed to that, so I didn't have that. So I'm grateful that they spared me from this. I found out about it when I went to my first trip to Israel. And they had friends that were in the Holocaust with them, and they wanted me to say hello and to meet them. And my father had saved this man's life. And so I went to their home and met them. And then they brought up that a child had died, that I had a brother that died. And I said, no, my brother's alive. And he, they said, no, he died. And they explained it to me. And I was shocked. And I asked my mother and father, what happened? We, you had a child you didn't tell me about. They said, yes, it was too painful to bring up. And we would have told you as you got older, but we didn't want to burden you with that at this point. And now that you know, I'll share that with you. And they shared that story with me. And it, it was tragic, but it made me realize how blessed that I was particularly to be alive and that I was basically living for not only this child that died, but another child that died later on of tuberculosis in the Holocaust as well. So I was really blessed and they did embrace me and my brother and did as much as they could for us because they realized the preciousness of having a child and of not having a child. So my experience in Israel was, was a wonderful one uh, in the sense that I learned more about my heritage and I also embraced the culture of Israel and the people and realized how beautiful it was. Now, when my parents came to the United States, uh, a lot of people were going to Israel and Israel, was not an option for everybody. My father was very ill. He had tuberculosis, he had a lot of ailments, and he wasn't the strong man that Israel needed to really build a country with their bare hands. So if you look at historical photographs of Israel and its development, you will see how beautifully Israel has become to today and what hard work people did to make Israel this beautiful country that it is. And it was done on our forefathers' backs where they had sweat and tears and they really worked hard physically to build infrastructure, to build a home, to build all kinds of things, synagogues. And it was it's just amazing what has happened to Israel. And Rosalie was so proud to experience that when she came to Israel with me. It's when I found out about the Holocaust and what happened, it was a little difficult to process that people could be so cruel, that people could do things like that to other people. And then I researched it and, and really became aware of what happened. And it was shocking shocking that other people, other human beings could do this to other human beings for nothing, for what?
for just a religious belief or a cultural belief. It was the most horrible thing to see, but it shows you that there are people that did survive and those who are our international heroes, they are blessed souls to share this with us, to share this with the world and to make sure that this never happens again. When I uh, realized that a lot of people that have been ch children or the child of a Holocaust survivor have had such difficult childhoods as well, because in essence, they've lived through the Holocaust as children. And that has had a big impact on them. So one of the things, it's wonderful to let your children to be aware of things, but not to burden them with the tragedies and the fear, because with children, they can magnify it, they take it in on themselves. And it's a very, very difficult thing. So I, as I said earlier, I feel so blessed um, that I didn't have a difficult childhood in that regard. And I was appreciative. I worked very hard as a child to you know, be a good girl and to do right by my parents. Uh, and was raised beautifully with a lot of love. They did everything for me and then some, and I appreciated it. And they taught me manners and how to deal with people and to be kind. And so this was such a beautiful gift from these two wonderful people who experienced a Holocaust where they lost everybody in their families. And uh, it, was, it was very tragic for them, but coming to a new country and rebuilding a life is beautiful. Uh, people have asked, well, do you feel guilt about what happened? And did they feel any guilt for surviving, survivor's guilt? Absolutely not. They were grateful every day. In fact, one of the things uh, my mother and father did was they tried to get my mother's parents to come, come with them where, where they went to in the survival realm uh, to go to Siberia. And uh, although it was as tragic as the concentration camps, because it was a gulag, it was the same story, but the other side of it. And you see that they were so grateful for being alive. They were so grateful that they lived. They had no guilt. They really appreciated every breath of life. And we really must never forget that. And I think that's what allowed them to live, my father into his 90s, and actually 90, and my mother to almost 103. Uh, the outlook of life of my mother, Rosalie Glass, was amazing. She had such joy. And if things didn't go right, she'd get over it quickly, a resilience. That's what it was. It was very difficult when she came to this country because she didn't know the language and she had to, you know, she had to become the breadwinner eventually until she and my father started a business together. But it was very difficult. Uh, you're also met with anti-Semitism rearing its ugly head in many instances. So it wasn't a great situation, but she adapted. She kept a positive attitude. She kept herself great. She was really proud to be in this country and embraced it and was just so grateful. And I think gratitude as well as resilience are the key words that people have to be aware of, to be grateful and to be resilient. Um, I was asked the question, that I was a very dedicated doting daughter. And was there any time that I felt angry for what my parents went through? Well, let's talk about being a doting daughter. I think it was the fact that because I was raised with gratitude, I was also grateful for everything they did for me and appreciated. And they were so great to me as a child that when I was an adult, I did everything I could for them, like buying them a home and sending them uh, on trips even to Israel, because Rosalie did go to Israel with my father as well at one point. So, you know, this was a very uh, big gift to be able to 
be reciprocating what they did for me. So that was really a beautiful thing. But I never felt guilty or angry. Uh, it's also beshared. They believed in the word beshared. The Yiddish word for beshared means meant to be. It happened. There's nothing you can do about it. And they felt that way, especially about the Holocaust. And so it was beshared that we came to this country, that they had me, that I was able to share their story. And not only that, but to do some good in the world through my books, through my lectures, etc., my films now. And so they were very, very proud and grateful for that as well, as am I. Now, it, I was asked, do I think that my parents' experience during the Holocaust has shaped me to who I am today? And I would say definitely yes, because it's made me a survivor, not a victim. And I think this is what all of you can relate to, especially with the Resilience Center, that you're not victims, you're survivors, you're victors. And it's really about being able to do anything you want in life and making a difference in this life that you were given, that you were blessed. So it has shaped me in these terrible times that we experience now. I think of Rosalie every minute where I hear her say through her words, which she, she also wrote in her book, bad times are not forever. And it's really true. Bad times are not forever. And we will get past this. And we have to not be a victim. We have to think what to do next. And that's the beauty of what you all are doing as well. And that's the beauty of, of what I do each day is what do I do next to make life a little better? The Jewish National Fund is responsible for incorporating resilience. They're not talking about victimhood. They're talking about resilience, rebuilding, making things happen, being positive, moving forward. And that is the beauty of your organization. I think that, uh, you know, there's also another question that people wanted to know about post-traumatic stress syndrome. Did Rosalie have it? No, she didn't because she didn't let herself live in the past. She forced herself to live in the present and the future. And that's what helped her so much. Now, my dad, I think he did have it in terms of it coming out in his sleep. It came out in dreams. And thankfully that didn't happen to Rosalie, but it's a very serious issue. But it, it, there is a way to help yourself through it in life and getting the proper help that you need. Um, I also want to um, say that this woman was the most remarkable woman because she was selfless. And so many of you in this organization are so selfless, giving of your time, giving of your money to really doing something great, to helping children to helping families, and that's such a gift. That's what Rosalie was about. One day, I'll give you an ex example. It was a rainy day in Los Angeles, California, something very rare, very, very rare. And she looked at me and she said, I'm feeling unhappy today. I said, why, mom? She said, because there are homeless people out there and they're gonna get wet and they're gonna be cold and it's a chilly day and we have to do something. So she made me go to this place in downtown Los Angeles and fill up my car with blankets. And we spent the whole day handing out these blankets, finding homeless people. And I would run out of the car and give them a blanket and she'd find them and say, oh, look, this is another person. Go, find, go give them a blanket. And it was so thrilling to her and to me to be able to make a difference. And when you see these people smile and they're so happy to be able to give them something that would keep them warm and safe and cozy in a very cold and windy, rainy day. That made a difference. So it's the kind of person she was, very open, very loving. Uh, when she smiled, she lit up a room. People were 
thrilled. They wanted to be in her presence. They wanted to do something for her. I have a wall of photographs of different people on the wall of Rosalie being kissed by so many men around the world because they were just drawn to her. They were drawn to her warmth and her kindness. She was like a walking mezuzah, women as well. People were just, were just loved her. They didn't know her, but they just were drawn to her, this magnetic being. And what was it about her that they loved and were drawn to? It was her gratitude, her respect for other people, her resilience and her not feeling sorry for herself, not feeling like a victim, but feeling that she was gifted and blessed. And I think that all of you can learn so much from the film and hopefully from the new film that I'm working on as we speak. And it, she would just be so proud to know that I'm speaking with you on her behalf because she would absolutely love and embrace all of you and the beautiful work that you're doing. God bless you all. Thank you. Shalom. My name is Michal Uziao, and I want to share with you my personal story today. I'm the head of the Eshkol Community Center. Eshkol is a community of 16,000 residents that lies on the border triangle of Israel alongside Gaza and Egypt. But uh, firstly, before being a community leader, I am a proud mother for three adorable children. In so many ways, we are all alike, you and I. We all, we are looking for happiness and meaning in life, but we are also very different. So let me just demonstrate you uh, from a, you know what, a children's song from my kids' kindergarten. It goes like this. Boom, 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 my goof shall be roed. Doom, 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 doom. So let me translate this, this cheerful children's song. It goes like this. Let's hurry up, hurry up, hurry up to the safe room. Let's hurry up, hurry up, because it's dangerous outside. My heart is pounding. Boom, boom, boom. My body is shaking. Doom, doom, doom. So yes, we are not that much alike. You know, I was uh, born in 1977 in Sinai. My parents' generation, they, they looked at us as babies and they said, probably by the age of 18, they won't have to go to the army. And obviously they were wrong. And we did serve in the army. At one point I met a nice kibbutznik and, and, and after six years of dating him, I forced him to marry me, of course. Otherwise he wouldn't propose and... Uh, and in 2004, we became proud parents to Shira, my, my first daughter. And we were you know, a young couple with, with the entire future ahead of us. And as a young mother, I was looking on the communities, the Jewish community that used to live in Gush Katif. And, and these people, Gush Katif was the Israeli communities within the Gaza Strip. And I couldn't understand how can anyone raise their children in such a place? How, how can they jeopardize their children? And it was horrific stories of terror attacks on, on mothers and children on, on yeshiva buchers on a Friday night. And in 2005, when Israel disengaged from Gaza, I felt it was the right thing to do. We hugged the people of Gush Katif because we knew how hard it was to, to leave their home and, and rebuild but we felt it was the right thing. And, and you Americans invested millions of dollars in greenhouses in Gaza for the Palestinian to flourish and to thrive over there, to invest in industry, in education. But the Hamas could, took control and they started to invest in the industry of hate and terror. Within weeks, they burned all the infrastructures and we woke up to a new reality. We call it the 15 seconds reality. What does it mean? It means that whenever a terrorist is shooting rocket from Gaza toward our communities, I and my community, we have 15 seconds to run for our lives. 
and it will always be 15 seconds. It's 15 seconds if I, even if I'm taking a shower and my daughter is playing outside, even if I'm, I'm sleeping in the middle of the night and I need to wake up to grab my children, to run to the bomb shelter and, and, and save them. Even one day I was walking with my twin boys that were born later on and, and in, the, in the middle of the day, beautiful sunlight and the siren goes off and I need to grab two toddlers and I can't, and I can't choose one of them. And I, I was screaming in the middle of the street for someone to help me because we have only 15 seconds. It's always 15 seconds. And it's not only that, it's, it's uh, in infiltrations, it's incendiary kites, it's, uh, it's terror balloons. Every day something happens. It can be one day 150 rocket, one day 30 rocket, and one day nothing. We call this emergency routine. What does it mean, emergency routine? It means that our life are not routine. Not like your routine anyway, and it's not also emergency. It's not always big operation that you read in the news about. It's emergency routine. It means that every day or every moment something might happen and you need to be prepared. And this is our day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, as a young mother, I thought, this is the reality. I, I was looking right and left and young couples and, and parents just like me, we were facing the same reality. It only happened when, when I was fortunate enough to become the shlicha, the Israeli emissary in Colorado. And suddenly my family and I arrived to the amazing Rocky Mountain state. And we looked right and left and said, wow, this is what normal life looks like. Suddenly, we don't need to always look for the shelter nearby. We don't need to worry that maybe in 15 seconds you will, we will have to run for our lives. Whenever there is a siren or something, we're saying, okay, it's okay. It's not the siren that we know from Israel. And this is normal life. And, and you know what? One of the amazing things that I really experienced in the United States was the notion that... Uh, Wow, we have an amazing Jewish community abroad. Wow, we have friends of Israel that care about us so much and are so generous with us. And, and during my stay there, I realized that the best gift I can give to my community was to give them the gift of knowing that we are not alone, that you are with us every step of the way. You know, I know, I see the way you look at the camera and, and, and I really urge you and I ask you, don't feel sorry for us because we don't, we're happy people. When we look right and left, we, you will see happy faces here. The narrative of, of, of victimhood and, and terrorism, this is not what dictates our life. We are positive people and happy people. And believe me, my number one concern is not how how to run and save my life and the terror attacks. My number one concern is like most women in the world is my diet and how to lose these five pounds that I gain. My number one concern is the, the sufganiyot in Hanukkah and how not to touch them and eat too, ma too many. This is what we are focusing in. And when I heard about Rosalie's story, I said, wow, this is a story of powerful woman. She chose life and we choose life here every day because when our children are having a hard time, we teach them cheerful songs and help them to cope. When, when we see that the children in, in, in high school are having a hard time, we teach them mindfulness and how to prepare them because life has challenges and, and we have our challenges, but, but we are positive people. We choose life and we are happy people and this is what is leading us. We even created a place that is called Resilient Centers. These amazing centers give one-on-one -on -one therapy to people who need help. They develop community programs and, and help us to strengthen the solidarity, the community support and the community cohesion and prepare us to the next emergency. Why? Because we choose life. Because when we are talking about resilience, we refer to positive things like leadership, like solidarity, like 
personal abilities. These are the resources that helps us to overcome any challenge in life. Think about your challenge in, challenge in life. When there is trust in leadership and a strong community, when you have strong personal abilities and faith that, that we will succeed in, and, and overcome and, and that we are not alone. It's a very strong element of resiliency to know that, that we are here to go through all challenges together and, and even grow from, from them. The Resilience Centers was created from the notion that people have natural resources. We all have natural resources within us and, and we need to train them and to strengthen them in order to develop and uh, harness them to their full potential. I called Russell Robinson, the CEO, the wonderful CEO of Jewish National Fund, and I asked him for some guidance, and he came. And, and, and ever since, Jewish National Fund has become our partners. And not, not only our partners, Jewish National Fund is our friend. Jewish National Fund is our family. Jewish National Fund sponsor our resilience center, the one-on-one -on -one therapy and, and the and that assist individuals suffering from stress, but also uh, support our programs to empower our community, the leadership and, and, and strengthen our resiliency as a whole. With us, they, get, they constantly think how to better our quality of life uh, and, and our children's quality of life. Together with them, we choose life together with you we choose life every day and i want you to know that that your footprints are everywhere in our community if you come and visit you can see it in painted shelters in the resilience center you will see it in new neighborhoods and water reservoirs but you will see it in, in the most you will see it in our strong leadership in our local pride and in our children's smiling faces this powerful faith that you created with us reminds us that we are not alone. You created another layer of, of resilience for us. Your leadership, uh, the, the constant uh, support, the financial back, backing, the, the emotional support, and always the fact that you're always sharing our story means so much to us. And, and it's like a blanket of security to our communities. And yes, we have the Iron Dome amazing defensive system that you Americans in helped us and supported the development in Israel. And it really saves lives in Israel. But it's not effective for our communities because we are in such a short range from, from it. And the Iron Dome is wonderful for the long range. For us, knowing that you are here with us, you are the Iron Dome. Just knowing that we are not alone gives us so much support and comfort. This is the Iron Dome. This is the Resilience Dome that our community needs so much. So I want to tell you Toda Raba for, for coming and listening and, and, and thank you for caring and being with us today. Now we will hear from our dear friend, Lynn Kapilov from Baltimore, one of the major supporters of, of the program and a, she will be interviewed by Ronnie Walk and she will share why this program is so important to her. Enjoy the rest of the program. Toda. Thank you, Michal. Your message of staying strong in the face of adversity is an inspiration to us all. Ladies, we have certainly learned a lot today about resilience. And now I'd like to welcome Lynn Kapiloff to our program. Lynn is a resident of Baltimore, and she is an ardent supporter of the JNF Resilience Programs in Israel. Thank you, Lynn, for joining us today and for sharing your story. Lynn, as you know, JNF supports a myriad of life-changing initiatives in Israel. There are many, many initiatives you could have chosen to support. So what is it about the resilience programs that resonate with you? They're actually helping, the therapists are actually helping the people of Israel, the people down near Eshkol at this point is the program that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, working on. And um, I'm glad to be able to help people cope with a 
um, intolerable situation and still continue to grow and become productive members of society. And I understand completely that, you know, these folks are living in such, such a, they have such a sense of uncertainty that they're living with on a daily basis. And, you know, I guess we can relate to that a little bit here in the U.S., uh, given the COVID situation, we are living with a sense of uncertainty. And um, I, I guess that's that's what we, we can understand about those folks living in Esco. Um, what can you tell me a little bit more about what it means to live with that sense of uncertainty in their community? Well, I lived with it myself well, many years ago in Baltimore, and I didn't have anyone to try to help me um, and my family. And so I've really dedicated uh, my, my um, contributions to helping people that would not have to cope with, I had to cope with. And of course, there's nothing as bad as what they're coping with over there. Um, I can't imagine um, having to choose between uh, going in a shelter, which children have to go into in 15 seconds, or families have to go into in 15 seconds, um, and possibly getting coronavirus, or um, staying outside and die. And my children didn't have bombs thrown into the yard, so that um, the children like to play with balloons, and so they would normally pick them up, and then of course they die. Um, and the stresses um, are terrible for them and for their families. And if they have someone there helping them cope with these situations, figure out how to stay stay calm or calmer and still be able to grow and to learn and to, to improve themselves, that's what's important. And can you briefly explain a little bit more about these, these tools that you mentioned? What types of tools are the residents given? The tools are giving therapists, people that are trained to work with, with people. Frequently, it's the families, the parents. Um, and then sometimes I understand they're taking the children and with them at the same time. So it's like a group, a group meeting. Um, I understand that they even have some where there's many families involved. And it's, it's one, one person helping another and trying to just fi figure a way to cope and still not be, um, not be so frustrated that you, that, 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 that you become frozen. And so you can relate and be calm by, by, by the people around you and continue to, you know, to participate and grow. When you use the term frozen, what do you mean by that? Well, if if you're terrified and you don't know what to do, I mean, do I do this? Do I do that? Do I just sit here? I mean, it's kind of like we are with the COVID right now. I mean, every all of us would like to be out. <laughs> it's, it's 10 months now, 11 months. And I mean, what are we doing? We're sitting, we're doing this on Zoom, not with people. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, um, uh, I don't think they had the high tech down there originally. I certainly, growing up, didn't have high tech. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, it's great that there are people that are down there that are helping them. And um, we're trying to reach the people through Zoom. Um, this is how meetings are being conducted today. Um, and if you don't have the tools uh, you don't have the internet and don't have the laptops for the kids, they can't participate. And so it's just a totally different way of, 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 of raising families and, and children. And um, it's very challenging. And if they have someone there to guide them, that's what's important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And can you explain which programs in particular you are most passionate about and which programs you, you support? Well, over the years, we've supported many, but right now I'm just supporting Eshkol and because they're right near the Gaza Strip, and I feel that they're the ones that are, uh, whose families are most challenged at the moment. Um, I may be incorrect, but that's my, inter well, that's, that's my interpretation of it, and uh, I can't wait to go there and see. I've been talking to some of the people. 
they've told me um, that they're very grateful and they're being able to help these people. And ironically, they've been asked to help other people in Israel right now. And I'm beginning to wonder if America doesn't need a resilience fund right now. <laughs> yes, we sure do. We sure do. You've mentioned to me in the past that your support comes in the form of supporting programs, not buildings. Absolutely. I building at all. <laughs> I care about the people, not about, not about buildings. Thank you. So true. Your view, it's interesting, your view regarding giving people the tools to better themselves, that view mirrors the vision of JNF. From supporting those with special needs to helping to build thriving communities in the North and the South, from helping those making Aliyah to integrate into Israeli society, to funding research to make Israel's produce industry bloom in the desert. Lynn, your mission mirrors JNF's mission to support the land and people of Israel so that they can stay strong and lead more productive lives. Can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with JNF and why you have chosen JNF specifically to donate and to support? Well, I feel with JNF, you're dealing with people, um, I th think, and you can actually go and visit and see what see what they are doing and how they were doing it, and you can reach people. Um, I know that they have to have buildings to do these programs in, but I'm not interested in building a building and having my name on a wall. I want to, because that's not going to help anybody. Um, I, I want to help the people. And I mean, you can be in a tent, you can be in a glorious building, you can be wherever, but it's the people that are important, not the buildings. Because um, they're the ones that are, are gonna determine our future, the, the, the young people. They're our future. And if, and if they get so uh, emotionally damaged, they won't be able to do this. And the nice thing about J and F is that you talk about helping the people when we can finally get out, when we can finally safely get on a plane, we can go to Israel and we can see where our dollars, Lynn, your dollars are being spent, how they're being spent. And we can meet the people that are benefit, benefiting from our support. Lynn, I wanna thank you for today, for sharing your vision, for sharing your heart, your personal story, because of you and other generous donors, families in the community of Eshel are getting the ongoing support and the tools they need to bravely face their challenges and stay resilient. So thank you again, Lynn. And now I turn the virtual podium over to the president of the JNF Maryland Board, Nancy Seff. Thank you. What a wonderful program this has been today. My name is Nancy Seff, and I'm also a proud member of the Sapphire Society. I'm equally proud to be the president of the Jewish National Fund in Maryland. JNF is my voice in Israel. It is my pleasure to thank all the people involved in this event, including our keynote speaker, Dr. Lillian Glass, our Eshkol Region Community Center representative, Michal Uziahu, our Eshkol Resilience Supporter, Lynn Kapiloff, and our JNF Women for Israel Advisor, Ronnie Walk. But I really want to emphasize that without the persistence of our WFI Chair, Phyllis Brown, this event never would have happened. Together with her event committee, Leslie Goldberg, Erica Schoen, and Deb Zager, we owe her a huge thank you. Thank you also to the JNF Board in Maryland, as well as our JNF professional staff, all of whom have put in many hours making this a wonderful program for everyone. This was truly a team effort. Please remember to check out our donation page at jnf.org slash donate resilience WFI. And I hope that you will all contribute towards the resilience programs highlighted today. I look forward to being in touch with all of you in the future. I would also like to invite you to the next WFI event 
hosted by Atlanta JNF on February 11th. It's titled Powerhouse, Gold Medal, Paralympian, Entrepreneur Mother and Israeli Force of Nature, featuring guest speaker Karen Leibovich. Check your emails for more details. And finally, Mid-Atlantic Sapphire Society members, please join us now for an exclusive personal briefing with today's speakers, Dr. Lillian Glass and Michal Uziahu. Check your emails now for the private Zoom meeting link, and we look forward to seeing you in just a minute. Thank you all for your participation. Jerusalem, Ikayala, me. 